Welcome to Startup Health TV. I'm your host, Logan Plaster. Today on the show, we'll be talking about trends in women's health with Missy Lavender, CEO and founder of Renalis, a company that's been with Startup Health since 2019. With Renalis, Missy and her team are pioneering new, tech-forward ways to deal with uh, pelvic health issues. For too long, says Missy, below-the-belt health, like bladder problems, have gone untreated, uh, stigmatized, even ignored. Even though these issues uh, are life-altering for millions of people and are an enormous market. With their digital therapeutic, Missy and the Renalis team are trying to open up this market and open up access to care for a community of women who, who for too long have gone without innovative health solutions. Hope you enjoyed the interview. Uh, when do you feel like uh, the turning point was in terms of all of this interest in the, the broader definition of women's health um, and also the fact that people would come to you pre-product, pre FDA, uh, did that happen in 2020? Did that did that shift happen mm -hmm. this year? Mm -hmm. So part of it was shifting last year. So people were starting to go. Well, I mean, obviously, you know, femtech was on the rise. You know, sexual health mostly. Um, anything around m m uh, maternity, right? Because the numbers were glaring, and and then menopause. So so, so women's health. You know what? Women's health is, is a cyclical, had been, for me, has been, I've seen two cycles of it, Logan. When we first got started in 2004, everybody was closing down their women's health. You know, if you mentioned menopause, it was like a death knell. Mm -hmm. And so we've, you know, in the last couple of years, we've recognized that, oh my God, women, <laughs> A, we're the, the biggest healthcare consumer, but more importantly, we consume more healthcare dollars. And these issues aren't like, here, take a pill for that. You know, they're, it's like, like a, it's a, as I say, it's a complicated place you need you need sometimes complex solutions, right? Just like everything. Yeah. But this, did, you know, the one thing that's been helpful from the pandemic for us is that two years ago, I heard at the American Telehealth Association, the, lead, the keynote speaker was like, you know, in 10 years, telehealth is just going to be health. Well, rapid yeah. fire through a pandemic. Yeah. So people are really looking for digital health solutions. Everybody's looking for digital, whether it's a hospital center or a drug company it's like oh we need a digital wrapper we need a digital we need to reach more patients keep them engaged we want patient monitoring so uh, are you seeing a shift in women in leadership positions uh in industry who who get these issues i mean because for decades you might have been selling into a system that was really male dominated who just didn't get it so i mean is that part of the shift it's just leadership in in enterprise companies there's one strategic that we're dealing with that's female dominated, not female led, but dominated. And they brought us in to work with them. There's, for example, in women's pelvic health, the majority of providers are female. And that helps us when we go out and look for pilot sites, for example, mm -hmm. those are, that's not the hard part of it. On the funding side, um, yeah, there are more women, women owned funds or women-led funds or women-led investment groups. Yeah, there's some of this. It's still minuscule as it relates to the, the potential, the possibility. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it doesn't hurt. I mean, I haven't yet seen anybody except me stand up and say, I'm a leaker, therefore this is important. Or, you know, I've got an out-of-control bowel or chronic yeah. pelvic pain. But there. What, what do you feel like um, in terms of mapping out this trend of um, an expansion of our understanding of women's health, connecting not just, you know, pregnancy and, and menopause, but really the more holistic. Um, when you talk to an investor about the um, opportunity there, kind of how do you outline it? How do you think about the opportunity in, in Femtech in the middle there? Well, so we always specifically talk about pelvic health, right? So things below the belt. And we talk about it, you know, that it's, there are, there is one bucket, two, vaginal and uterine health that specifically focus on, you know, people with female anatomy, but pelvic health affects everybody. Pelvic health disorders, except for those two, can affect both any gen, anybody with a pelvis. Right. So first of all, we talk about, you know, this is a part of the body that consumes a lot of dollars that people, for whatever reason, um, shame, stigma, 
lack of awareness of how it connects to the rest of the body um, or the whole person has been really um, in the water closet, you know, really sidelined. And so if you think about it and you realize that the research shows if you have a pelvic health disorder of male or female, you know, depression is higher, anxiety is higher, lack of mobility is higher, lack of intimate relationship or connection is higher. That all leads eventually, you know, the trickle down effect, all puns intended, is, you know, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, you know, the things that we're worried about. And I always say, if you, if you really want to solve that nut, if you really take it on in a different way, you know, the chicken's below the belt or the egg mm. or whatever thing, you know, you, you have to go really whole person and understand when, when your pelvis is over here on the sidelines, it's, you know, the rest of you is not, not happy. Yeah. Um, I, that makes so much sense intuitively. I mean, do you have numbers to back that up? Do you have is there science to back that, that, that you could draw a line from pelvic health to obesity or these other, I don't know, depression, whatever, these other things? Absolutely. There's published research on, on all of the above. And, and interestingly, there's a great study, NIH funded multi-site under the Pelvic Floor Disorders Network that looked at, it's called the PRIDE study. It's called, it looked at uh, weight loss and incontinence. So we know that obesity, if you look at the top five factors, and we're talking now urinary incontinence, but fecal will be the same. You know, obesity is a huge one, just puts, you know, pressure on things that are trying to stay closed, and that's hard. Um, and say so to put these women through a weight loss program over X weeks, I forget, and they lost ish 8% eight, eight of their body weight. So, and they were morbidly obese. And oh gosh, shockingly, their bladder control improved. And what was interesting to me, Logan, when I was talking to the, the lead PI out at UCSF, is she said, you know, Missy, these women are more motivated to lose weight because their bladder symptoms are improving than they are because, you know, this might end my life sooner. So I'm like, let's see, that's our chicken, right? That's, that's the thing that, you know, we have to understand because I always say if you're leaking, bleeding, or in chronic pain, you're not going to leave your house. You're not going to get on that beautiful walkway that you just built in my neighborhood. You're not going to the gym, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, that's why we did our total control program in the beginning where it's like, God, if we could get you in a gym and we could solve this problem or help you, then maybe you'd leave the class and jump on a treadmill. Mm. And, you know, it, it was really powerful. So it's, I find it fascinating to think about moving upstream and upstream. Um, you could have all the apps in the world encouraging you to jump rope or jog yeah, and if you don't take yeah. care of this other issue you'll never get there and you're like why isn't it working why why aren't people signing up for my you know type 2 diabetes app that has all these other behavior change things and right. they've got something that's like nagging at them that's bothering them on like a minute to minute basis yeah and so you know when we talk about like our solution we talk about cc you know her her goal starting with female anatomy is to replicate an experience that somebody would get with a pelvic floor PT. And we're starting with overactive bladder. That's the gotta go, gotta go thing. A, because it's super expensive, very prevalent, crosses all persons with a pelvis. We'll start with women. But the thing about it is it responds really well to PT. Well, you know, even before a pandemic, finding, going to, continuing to go to, paying for, leaving work, all that was challenging with any amount of physical therapy. Mm. Then you add intimate physical therapy and you get like a, get some of that. Yeah. Well. Okay, heat of the pandemic. So, so, and what's interesting is it's much more efficacious than even medication if it's done, you know, eight to 12 times with a, with a pelvic floor PT, which is a big if, right? Um, so, you know, I look at it and go, okay, can we, can we hit the 70%? Probably not. Can we do as well as our total control program, which was 25% of those women had their symptoms gone after 11 weeks? That's my floor. You know, we're going to, we're going to try to double that, but you know, we're going to have an, we're going to have an impact. And, yeah. and then what else can we attack digitally? You know, what else can we, you know, and this stuff, I mean, Logan, oh my God, it's like, drink a little bit more of this, drink a little less Starbucks, God forbid. But it's not, it's not rocket science. Is that what you're saying? It's like um, low do, hanging do fruit, me. low it's hanging, hanging fruit. fruit. It's yeah. low hanging it's, fruit. And, it's, and yet it's, it doesn't mean that it's easy to do. It doesn't mean that your job's easy. No. It just means that it's no. right out there to be grasped. Yeah. And you tell a woman, okay, so my personal moment, um, I'm at my pelvic floor PT and I'm like, this is when my baby was like, maybe he was two. I'm like, oh my God, you know, I am leaking like every afternoon. And, and my PT was like, huh, well, I you know you don't drink coffee. And, and I was like, yeah, I get this really strong urge. And then, you know, I can't make it home from the park. And she's like, wait, what, what else are you drinking? I'm like, well, you know, diet Mountain Dew. 
And she's like, when are you drinking that Diet Mountain Dew? I'm like, I have a can. I put it over a big cup of ice. I walk to the park. And then, oh my God, I had no idea. Caffeine, carbonation, and NutraSweet are all potential bladder irritants. And for me, I'm now a recovering Diet Mountain Dew addict because I loved it. But that was just like us. Somebody had to connect the dots, right? Yeah. To, or why does it matter if you're constipated? Or why does it matter if you don't sit down on the toilet, you know, and you hover? Yeah. You know, just like really, like you said, low hanging fruit, but then I have to be reinforced. I have to have a goal. I have to want to hit my goal. I have to have somebody cheering me on, you know, all the stuff you get when you see a person. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm struck by the theme you mentioned a second ago, which is that there are all of these issues that we deem a bit more intimate and the uh, move to telemedicine all of a sudden opens up opportunities where maybe I, I might have been a little embarrassed or just a little slow to act because I just don't want to go in and see somebody for this issue. Right. Could be any range right. of things. Some people feel that way about normal visits, right? Um, right. But what other things does that distance enable? You know, like kind of a market of, of issues that you were a little yeah. hesitant, you're a little hesitant to talk to someone about, a little hesitant to go into an office about, but if it was made easy, um, what other areas could you address sooner? Yeah, it's a great, great question. I, keep, I was thinking as you were talking, you know, 80% of all urologists, for example, are located in major metropolitan areas. You know, there's only 45,000 female pelvic medicine urologists and, and gynecologists in the country. So access is one of the biggest things that's driving us as a, as a company, you know, because I always think of, you know, Molly in Missoula, Betty and Brie, Ohio, you know, people of, of, of lower SCS, you know, if you've got, I mean, you're not primary care person is not talking to you about this stuff. So yeah, it opens up, it, it, it opens up the possibility for, I mean, in our case, you know, we're really focused on pelvic health, but you know, people may not even want to talk about breast health. They mean, you know, sure. this is any, there's so much shame and stuff in this. And, 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 and sometimes it's not shame, Logan. It's just, I don't know that that's a thing. Yeah. Like, I don't know. It's not normal to be curled up in a ball two days a month with my period. And my 12 year old's doing it the same. I didn't realize that she could have potentially symptoms of fibroids at 12. So that's actually our first platform yeah. launching in, in a research study, hopefully this week. It's like, Sp speaking of your actual platform, we've been talking in generalities about the issues, but go mm -hmm. ahead and give me like a, a roadmap of what you've built mm -hmm. and kind of what's coming out in the next 12 months. Yeah, yeah, good. So we're building what we like to call a conversational agent. Don't use the word chatbot because it uh, looks like a you know, customer service agent. Thing. Got it, got it. Yeah, yeah. so co conversational agent. So it, it's a, it will be an app that speaks to you like you're texting your best girlfriend who's a okay. nurse practitioner. Okay. So she takes in data, so validated proms, um, goal setting, um, a, a, a digital bladder diary that's embedded in the platform. And then those data run through um, our proprietary algorithms, care pathways, um, uh, different uh, treatment guidelines from the various societies, and they spit out a starting point for her. That's the therapeutic. And then Is this natural your, language processing or choose your own adventure branching? Right, it's choose your own adventure branching with some open texting when we ask her about you know this, that, or the other thing. Got it. Um, as we get more data, and I mean, certainly the algorithm gets smarter, um, and we can, you know, start aggregating and doing all sorts of colorful things with it. Um, and and so it, what we're got launching hopefully in the next two weeks is a simplified version of that for fibroids and endometriosis. So that platform is meant to connect a person who's interacting with it to what's normal and what's not normal around bleeding. So that's our first platform. But then we're also launching. We were funded by a strategic to launch a a consumer facing version of our OAB platform, our bladder platform. And we're going to put that in the hands of about 200 women over the next month to a month and a half. And we want to see what it does for them interacting with that for a month, or sorry, for a week. And that one's kind of like our total control program. It's like little uh, tips and topics around bladder health. And it does, it is personalized based on what's their most concerning symptom. It does take them down different channels and branches. Um, it does have some question about knowledge, about motivation, and then we'll see how that changes possibly. We're expanding that for another SBIR that we're writing in January. Plus, there's a possibility that could be interesting in a primary care setting, for example, because sure. they're getting 
you know, they have very few tools in their toolkit, but there's a drug launching next year that um, just announced that they're partnering with another company to hit that PCP market. So mostly we're using it for data, but in the future, it could be a revenue platform too. So got it. Got it. Makes sense. Do you have a, do you have sort of an ideal partner when you think about trying to reach into society and really, you know, touch this group of people? Um, who would yeah. you, who would you partner with to do that? So on the strategic side, um, it would be certainly pharma. There's, there's a, anybody who's in the overactive bladder space should have a digital wrapper is what they call them. And that would be a very logical partner. Um, when it comes to the distribution, one of our strategic is a large, is a, a manufacturer of adult diapers. They're potentially a good partner to give that, you know, as an add-on service to what they're doing because they're more of a boutique, but a good one. You'd buy, um, the, you'd buy the package, it would say, download this app, you know, picture of the app mm -hmm. on the outside, and then you're mm -hmm. off, you're off to the him, races. Give them a code. Yeah, exactly. Um, can and you then put, a, can you put a number on what, how big that market is? I'm just curious. Do you know the how big? The adult diaper market? Yeah. Oh, it's like $4 billion. I'd have to do a quick Google search, but it's a big one. Okay. It's a huge one. <laughs> but mostly it's going to be health systems and um, our ultimate, ultimate, customer or payers, like everyone, you know, that we're really going to look hard at the health economic data, Logan, of not only, you know, treating a portion of these patients, you know, if I can, again, take that 25% off of their, off of their docket, so to speak, that's a cost savings. But then it's more importantly, keeping these people connected as they continue to move through the healthcare system, because the funnel is huge, but only about one to 4% of the patients even get to third line care. So first is behavioral, second is drug, third, there's Botox and there's neuromodulation, two kinds. Patients don't even know those exist. You know, they, they don't want to go to a PT or they tried to Kegel and it didn't work. So then they get a medication and, and there's side effects and big ones to, to some of those. And they're like off of those in under three months and then they just go away. So keeping, widening that funnel and keeping them connected is good for everything, including mm -hmm ultimately making them better and ultimately keeping them, you know, getting them moving, keeping them on those other life, life goals. And is your future goal to expand the offering so that you uh, have more of that funnel as part of your company? So we're looking at other conditions. So, so right now we're starting with overactive bladder. The, the related stress incontinence is definitely, that's an easy add on, but also fecal incontinence, which is a big problem. Um, not IBS, but actual losing stool or gas. That's a that's an easy add-on as well. And then we're really interested long-term in chronic pelvic pain. Um, it's kind of the opposites, you know, versus strengthening pelvic floors. That's a group that would relax and it's multifactorial. So it wouldn't be the sole thing they might need, but it's, it's a group of patients that has very few options. What are your thoughts on changing the narrative? You know, we've talked already about this, you know, the stigmas attached to some of these issues. Um, what's your strategy for, for trying to change that narrative and say, hey, these are things that we can uh, sell products to people, you know, at Target and talk about and market and get it out there. What's your strategy? Yeah, so keeping in mind, we've been doing this for almost 17 years with our related profit. You know, the first thing is we shifted the dialogue to health. So you know, I, I want billboards that say, you know, I want my pelvic health. I deserve great pelvic health. You know, that should be something that we are clamoring about as, as, as persons with female anatomy, um, however we identify. But men too, you know, if you've got something going on below the belt, it is scrambling your brain all the time. It doesn't leave here. Yeah. So that's just not okay. So first thing is to just recognize that you're one of 30 or 50 or whatever million you want to throw at the board, it's all going to be low. And there are things you can do there. And this is what our total control program was, you know, I'm going to take you through some things and you can try them right now. And that's what CC will do too. And then if this doesn't work, you know, there are people that actually do this for a living that can help you be yeah. they PTs or nurses or nurse practitioners or doctors. And then oh, there's a whole bunch of things that you should try. And we always tell patients to keep asking until they're satisfied. Yeah. So just, I had, I have, oh my God, I got a call the other day from a woman who's in a wheelchair. She had an accident three years ago with a tree and she was told by her doctor, she has recurrent UTIs. I've done everything I can. I don't mm. want you to keep taking antibiotics because if you get in trouble and you get MRSA, you, you know, you'll die. 
Yeah. Oh my God, that is not okay. She's 47 years old and she's a lawyer and she has three little kids. So I just connected her with one of the centers of excellence and they're going to try a couple of really different things. Okay, this is totally off topic. But it's not. It's really one of the other things that drives me, Logan, is if we know that half of all marriages end in divorce, I can tell you, and I'm one of them, Frank, pelvic health disorders, I will guarantee you, contributed to 99.9% .9 of them. Because we, know, we mm -hmm. know money and sex are the one and two biggest issues of marital discord. Yeah. Again, leaking, ble bleeding, and chronic pain is not going to make you want to get all sexy with your partner. Yeah. So that's just like, if I could tell a 26 year old, hey, if you're already dealing with this and you just, you know, you're just like four years into your marriage, you gotta take action because it's not, doesn't bode well for you. Interesting, you know, I, that's, like, fast, that's fascinating. I, I'm just inspired by that idea of uh, peeling back the layers um, and trying to get to root causes, um, mm -hmm. not, not, slap, not slapping a Band-Aid on the, the divorce issue. Um, but really mm -hmm. peeling it back and understanding it better and better. I think it's fascinating. Yeah. And the same thing from health, you know, it's like we were talking about with obesity. It's like, okay, what else is going on, you know, that, yeah. that you could do that you're thinking completely out of the box with it's okay. Nutrition, diet and exercise diet. We've been telling women that forever people forever. So yeah. what's, what's, you know, is it lack of food access? Is she living in a food desert? Is it her bladder out of control? Is it, you know, she's bleeding constantly. I mean, like, what else is, what else can we address? So, so I guess so, I'd like to see pelvic health elevated in the, in the primary health issues that we screen people for. Yeah. That'd be amazing. That makes sense. I love it. So your agent, your automated agent will, uh, our, our conversational, the, conversational our application. You can just call her, you can just call her an app. Whatever. Uh, a CC. conversational agent. Yeah. CC. CC. Uh, in the future will really be your guide through this world. Uh, here, here are some things you can try. Maybe we need to elevate care. Here are some centers of excellence uh, and kind of be with you through the journey. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Well, she's going to be a prescribed digital therapeutic. That's where we're going. So FDA okay. approval prescribed. So her, your doctor will prescribe it um, when you call potentially and make your appointment to see them. Because some of these doctors, it's 46 months yeah. to get into or weeks or whatever. Um, or she comes in for her first telehealth or virtual or otherwise visit. And the doctor says, okay, I want you to try this first. I'm going to prescribe this, this interaction with Cece. And then if you need more, you know, she'll flag you know, there's certain times where she gets flagged and says, okay, we need to get in touch with your doctor or whatever. Um, and when it's EMR integrated down the line, that'll just be a natural, like live chat with nurse Barb right now or virtual yeah. consult. You know. No. Interesting. How, um, so in terms of like the proprietary side of this, um, mm -hmm. I assume that that kind of comes in when you think about kind of the brain of all the research required to really understand pelvic health. So, um, is that kind of where you've spent your time kind of building up that base of knowledge? Yeah. So again, we've got 17 years worth of content from our nonprofit, from the books I've written, from various studies. We've got people on our board and advisory board that have given us like proprietary care pathways um, or access to theirs. We've got the practice guidelines. And then we just put it all together into this patient journey and our content team or you know, PhDs, pelvic floor PTs, nurses, doctors. It's like, okay, let's lay this out. Fantastic. Well, uh, I think it's, I think it's awesome. It's great to get the update. Um, and I would love to share this story with the world. So, um, me too. Thank you.